Um, people, uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> Um, firstly, also, I just want to tell you, I had my fourth vaccine yesterday, so I'm a little bit, mm. um, so just be patient. But anyway, today my topic is on demons in ancient Egypt, the role of demons in ancient Egypt, um, and why we think they're evil, because actually, originally, they were neutral beings. Um, so... Let me find a mouse that works. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Right. Can you see the next picture? Yes. Okay. So um, demons are always drawn in this particular way, squatting in a doorway, holding a knife. Um, and there you are. Um, so hopefully... I can demonstrate that they're not always bad. Um, and I'm also going to be talking a little bit about magic and about monsters and the roles that uh, these rituals placed, held in ancient Egyptian societies. So my first uh, thing to tell you is really what do we understand by magic and more specifically what do i mean in this lecture so what i mean in this lecture is essentially what we call anthropological magic which is part of the legitimate religious practice whereby practitioners of magic try to get a result from the gods or from the environment in order to you know prevent a death prevent a storm ensure a good harvest um, so they do certain rituals, um, they say certain prayers um, in, ex in expectation of a certain kind of reward or a certain kind of result. So it's not uh, illusions um, like we see tricks on TV. So I mean anthropological magic, which used to be considered a normal part of religion long time ago. Right. So what is a demon? And what is a god? Well, um, according to the people who studied <clears throat> these beings, they discovered that there were types of beings that were not fully gods, but still kind of interacted with the gods. Um, and these, we know that they're not fully gods because they didn't have their own cults of worship. They didn't have temples built for their name, and they also did not appear in the creation myths of the society. Um, but yet they appear quite a lot in the writings, and as you can see, uh, they're colored in in red, and they also have their names written in red. And these were malevolent spirits in a way. They were beings that could move between the physical world and the spiritual world and essentially they were messengers okay so here we see them again um they're very curious they're always squatting they're holding knives and as you can see they're i guess fantastic uh we have a snake with arms and a snake with legs and the snake is holding the butcher's knives um so the definition of a demon in ancient Egyptian religious practice was very fluid in the sense that also they didn't have one particular word for what a demon was. They had the word wear it, which is the most consistently used word. And it means something like bad spirit, malevolent spirit. Um, but actually where it was not essentially an evil being, where it kind of takes the role of the arch enemy, the one who opposes you. If you imagine the role between uh, Sherlock Holmes and Professor Moriarty, this is the one, he challenges you. And, you know, if you have enough encounters with the Werrits, then you become a better person and you, you learn new, new skills. So they're not necessarily evil. Um, and in ancient Egyptian religion, we have two types of these demons. We have guardian demons and we have wonder demons. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the guardians. Um, and as you can see, these are guardians here. So guardian demons were considered agents of protection. 
Um, they are usually defined in a static location. Um, they normally hold a butcher's knife and they act as a kind of bouncer at a club. If you're a member of the club and you've got a club card, you can come in. If not, they don't let you in. Um, although they're villains themselves, they are used to counteract greater evil, very much like Seth here, who's the god of chaos, who's employed to ward off this chaotic snake who attacks Ra during Ra's journey in his solar bark. Um, and I think the best analogy would be the Prague Golem, who himself was a kind of brutish villainous creature, but he was uh, used to pr protect the people of Prague. So he had a dual role. So this is essentially what the guardians were, although they were what we would call evil, brutish, villainish, um, they could be employed as agents of protection. And my first example here is this female demon called Taweret, and we know she's a demon because she has Weret in her name. So I guess we should say demoness. Um, she is, sorry? She is the guardian of pregnant mothers and childbirth. Um, and she is a composite being. She is a pregnant hippopotamus. She has arms and legs of a lion. Um, she has a crocodile on her back, as you can see. She's also holding the butcher's knives. And here she has a wand. Now, always in ancient Egyptian religion, um, the wands are snakes. The snakes become wands and the wands become snakes and they're interchangeable. Um, and you'll remember this from the story of Moses. So um, the hippo became the protector of motherhood because the hippopotamus is a very fierce creature. She always protects her young um, and she was incorporated into their religion as a protector of pregnant mothers and newborns. And in fact, there is a ritual here, which you can see, I hope, where there's a hippopotamus tusk and the pregnant woman is giving birth in a magical circle protected by the spell on the tusk and there's another circle for the baby after delivery. So this is a guardian demon. Right, the next demon we have are the wanderer demons. The wanderer demons were very problematic. They were agents of disease. They are called murderers, wanderers, and watchers, and they walk around causing trouble, very much like Satan did in the book of Job. Um, and this is a spell against breath plague which I guess is what we're suffering from now during Corona. And it actually says here, retreat murderers, no breeze will reach me so that passes by demons would pass on. Okay, I'm Horus and I pass the wandering demons. Okay, so this is words said by a man with wood in his hand, let him go outside and make the round in his house and he will not die from the plague of the year. It's very, very old, and apparently they had breath plagues even then, so nothing, nothing's changed. Right, okay, and this is just a little joke. Pharaoh's face when you've only survived one plague. He's bored with us, as you can see. And another wonder demon is uh, Ashmedai. Um, this is a picture of an incantation bowl from the Babylonian period. Ashmedai was considered quite powerful. Of course, he could make you sick. He could even kill you. But if you said the right prayer, you could trap him inside this bowl. And this prevented him from rattling around your house. Um, of course, if you ever figured how to get out of the bowl, you'd be in trouble. But uh, for now, he's stuck in the bowl. So this was part of ritual magic that was a legitimate part of the religion. Okay, next we have Bastet. Uh, Bastet is a goddess of hygiene and cleanliness. Um, how she became a goddess of cleanliness and hygiene was that although the ancient Egyptians didn't really understand the mechanism of diseases, they didn't understand biology, they did observe that fleas and lice bit the rats. Um, the rats in turn bit people or they infected the brain with their contaminated germs and when Bastet came and killed all the rats, they had much less disease. 
So she became a kind of anti-plague goddess. And here she is being worshipped. And of course, here she is in a box because she's a cat. So there she is. Um, right. So what causes plagues besides the wanderer demons? Uh, plagues are caused by angry gods. Plagues are caused by bad heavenly conjunctions and eclipses. And obviously, plagues are caused by contact with foreigners. And that actually might be realistic because foreigners do have different germs. And of course, our immune systems are not always necessarily able to um, avoid getting sick. So if you don't know what foreigners look like, these are Hyksos. Um, and here you can see Libyans, Nubians, and Asiatics. And then finally, an Egyptian. And like today, uh, when there were times of plagues, they closed all their borders and they kicked out the foreigners. So there we have it. This is a protective amulet against plague. And as you can see, it uh, looks very much like a mezuzah. It's a, a piece of scroll that gets encased in this little amulet of gold. And as you can say, as you can see, it keeps you safe from every male spirit, every male dead, every male demon, every female spirit, every female dead, every female demon, every kind of death, every kind of illness, every kind of evil eye, every ego, evil glance, every evil injury, and also from the magic of foreigners. It protects you from the magic of Syrians, Nubians, and Libyans. So there you have it. Right, so why do we get plagues? Plagues, of course, are very problematic, uh, particularly angry gods. You've got to figure out why the god is angry, why he's sending you an earthquake or a flood. You've got to figure out what you did, what you did wrong, which god you offended, because you don't always know. The gods don't tell you. And on top of that, how to soothe the angry god. So this is a prayer written by King Mesulus of the Hittites to the storm god. Here is a translation of the prayer. And the Hittites suffered a 20-year plague. How did they get this? If you remember my previous lecture, I spoke a little bit about Prince Sun Nanza, who was killed en route to marry Tutankhamun's widow. He was killed by the pharaoh Ai, who married Tutankhamun's widow, and then subsequently she disappeared. So we assume that she was murdered. But this prince, this Hittite prince, was also murdered en route. Um, his father was very, very angry at the loss of this child. And so what happened was, is that he sent some soldiers and they performed a punitive raid against the certain states that Egypt uh, administered, the Canaanite states, and they took prisoners of war. And as soon as they did that, of course, these prisoners of war had different diseases and they introduced plague into their society and this plague lasted 20 years. So hopefully Corona will not last 20 years. Uh, I guess if it does, we can say these prayers. Right, what the Hittites did uh, formulate to get rid of disease was the ritual of the scapegoat, which was quite interesting. They took two lambs, rams, sheep, goats, one they covered in the curses tied with wool. And as you can see, he's got red wool around his horns. And they threw this goat out of the city on the road towards their enemies covered in all the curses. And the second goat they would sacrifice as a blood sacrifice to their gods. Um, occasionally, they would actually send all the prisoners of war out into the streets as scapegoats. And even sometimes they would dress them in the king's clothes, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, and of course, this is a, incorporated into Leviticus. Um, there is a scapegoating ritual mentioned, mentioned there. Um, and we have Azazel. There's some debate over the meaning of this word and the origin of the word Azazel. Some people think it is a demonic spirit of uncleanliness of the wilderness. And other people feel it just means to remove from, you know, like the root Azuz. Okay, so plagues in general were considered just calamities uh, 
very bad things happening to society. And of course, here is a Pashkaval from 1980, where uh, plagues of archaeology are sweeping the land of Israel. So uh, be aware of that. <laughs> Okay, um, after plagues of archaeology, um, the next wonder demon that we have are sleep demons. Now, sleep demons are a subset of the wanderers. They're considered particularly vicious because they enter your body while you're sleeping and you're defenseless. They make you sick, they disturb your mind, they disturb your mental health. Um, and what the ancient Egyptians did was they carved spells onto the head wrists which we have here. Okay, so this is a headrest, which kind of served as a pillow, I guess. You put your head there, and there are all sorts of inscriptions here. And as you can see, this is a guardian demon here. He's holding a snake wand, and he's also holding a spear, and he is going to ward off all the nightmares. And I thought I found this very cute picture of a teddy bear defending a sleeping child against the nightmare, which I thought was very sweet. And uh, this is the anti-nightmare spell. So if you have dreams again, it's against the male enemy, the female enemy, the male dead, the female dead. Any opponent who comes in order to attack this person during the night, during the day, and in every moment, you will be destroyed in your tomb. Okay, so this is important because after you've died, you could actually die in the afterlife. So this is a very serious threat. You will be persecuted with violence and a net will be placed against you in the sky. And Seth will be against you on earth. Okay, I have made sure that you sail to the north without having the chance to approach the land. And I will destroy your tomb and burn your coffin. Okay, so... This is really a terrible curse, certainly by the standards of ancient Egypt. Right, next we have another subset of the sleep demons, the incubi and the succubi. So these demons were supernatural entities that appeared to men at night and seduced them. Um, the ones that appeared to men were called succubi. The ones that appeared to women were called incubi. Um, I don't know, they were very popular because people like to talk about, you know, having sex in the sleep. So there were lots of salacious fireside tales about these, but they were considered to be very, very evil and dangerous. And the first succubus we have recorded in history is actually this demoness called Lamashtu from Nineveh. Um, the first person who is considered to have been uh, able to turn himself into a spirit and have sex with women, is the hero Gilgamesh's father, whose name was Lilu. Um, and apparently he would wander around the city in the form of an incubus and, I don't know, seduce women without their consent. Um, and eventually, as this mythology progressed, he developed a female counterpart mm -hmm called Lily II, which many people believe is the origin of Lilith in uh, Judaism, because Judaism had some contact with uh, Persian Zoroastrianism. And she was incorporated into Jewish mythology as Lilith. But in Nineveh, in Sumerian and Mesopotamian mythology, she's called Lamashtu. She's very evil. She particularly attacks pregnant women she steals babies when mothers are breastfeeding. She sucks their blood. She gnaws their bones. Um, and as you can see, she's a composite creature. She's got wings. Uh, she's got talons of a bird. She's got legs of a lion. She's got a donkey face, but she has large teeth. And she's considered to be the chaos demon. So that is the oldest representation of what was to become Lilith, Lilith. So how do we get rid of the demoness is we invoke the king of demons. This is Pazuzu. Uh, Pazuzu is the Sumerian or the Mesopotamian demon who's the male counterpart of Lamashtu. And in order for Lamashtu to not steal children and menace pregnant women, 
we invoke him like Seth. Seth was the god of chaos and brute force, but we got him to protect Ra in the solar barge against that chaotic snake. So we also get Pazuzu to protect us uh, against Lamashtu. And here you can see Lamashtu is busy trampling a donkey to death. And this is Pazuzu holding this amulet to protect us from uh, the menacing Lamashtu demoness. So he could be invoked to perform defensive magic. Although he himself could bring evil, he apparently used to bring uh, drought and plagues and uh, locusts. So uh, I guess it depends uh, which side of the fence you're sitting on. Huh? Right. So now I get to the translation part of the speech, which is why is it that we think demons are evil when in ancient societies they were mostly considered to be neutral beings? So the English word that we use for demon is morally loaded because we're translating to a word that already has an embedded cultural meaning. Um, we all know, as taught by religions, that, you know, demons are evil, they destroy you, and devils corrupt. And we wouldn't ever consider the possibility of a good demon. But the English word that we use for demon is derived from the classical Greek word daimon. And daimon just means a supernatural being that has supernatural power. Um, it's very similar to the Latin word for uh, genius, when people were born, they had a guiding spirit, which was their genius. And if they were particularly good at something, then, you know, this was due to their genius, um, which was their guiding spirit. So Plato and Homer wrote about demons in very neutral terms. Um, in fact, Homer uses the word interchangeably with the word theos. Theos is the word for God. Um, Essentially, Theos is the personality of the God, and Demon is the activity of the God. So much uh, late, and oh, and Plato also writes that, you know, demons were intermediates. They were interpreters, they were ferrymen, they could carry messengers to the gods, bring messages from the God, you know, like, uh, I guess, uh, in Hebrew, Malach is a messenger. So this is the role of demons. But if humanity was badly behaved, demons could be agents of punishment, which is why they eventually got their bad reputation, because they were used to punish people for being bad. Um, and of course, demons got incorporated into Judaism because of Judaism's contact with Persian Zoroastrianism during the Babylonian exile. So there we have a, a picture of Zoroaster who seems to be trampling a dragon. And uh, we have a Persian magician. So the word magic is also not a negative, I mean, not now any longer a positive word. It used to be a neutral word, um, the word we use in English comes from the Greek Megaea, and that word in turn came from the Persian word magus. Um, and magus was just a word to describe the Persian magicians who were called Magoi, and the type of magic that they were performing, but eventually the type of magic that they performed was considered to be fraudulent, unconventional, and dangerous. And essentially, when they had contact with Greek society, the Greeks felt that their magic, the Persian magic, was against the Greek gods. So this word, Megaea, became a negative word. And then when it was incorporated into Latin, it retained that negative meaning. And ultimately, you know, the Latin language was used by the early Christians. So the early Christians adopted this embedded meaning that all magic was bad because it was non-Christian, and particularly early Christians categorized a diverse range of magical practice. There was enchantment, witchcraft, incantations, divination, necromancy, astrology, all of them being black magic, 
And in ancient Egyptian religion, there was no such thing as black magic. All magic was legitimate. It was part of normal religious actions, uh, worship. So again, this word started off as a neutral word and it became a negative word over time through use, through contact with other cultures. And finally, our third word, uh, which is also badly translated, is the word monster. So monster, again, is derived, derived from the Latin word monstrum, which is defined as a sign that disrupts the natural order of things. It's an unnatural event. It's deviant. It's a malfunctioning of nature. So monsters, essentially, as we see here, this is Amit. She's the great devourer. She's part crocodile. She's part lion, and she's part hippopotamus. And she is the one who is supposed to devour your soul if your soul is found to be unworthy. When after you die, you are sent uh, to the hall of judgment. But again, um, composite beings became negative things because essentially they were unnatural. So what we are now in search of is a neutral word for a neutral being. So seeing as angels and demons are essentially interchangeable, um, the word I like to use is liminal beings. And liminal beings are beings that live in the space between two worlds. So they can cross into the physical world, they can cross into the spiritual world, they can send messengers between the humans and the gods but they don't really belong to either world. They're kind of amphibious, ambiguous beings. Um, and at least if you're called a liminal being or a border crosser, this doesn't actually have that embedded negative meaning. And of course, I've said it here, the Hebrew word for messenger is. Um... So now we come to the creation of Satan. So Satan is a non-Christian composite. Um, over time, as Christianity spread, all polytheistic religions were seen to be wrong. Um, and Satan was composed out of the pitchfork of the Roman de de deity Neptune, the horns of the Canaanite storm god Baal, the hoofs of Pan, the wings of Lamashtu, or who later became Lilith, and the forked tail of the Egyptian god Seth. So if you see these three rolled into one, we have uh, the Christian composite of Satan because in polytheistic religions, we don't have one overall God of goodness and we don't have one overall God of evil, but because Christianity only has one God, they now have one supreme deity of pure evil, um, which is how Satan was created. So now we have the role of magic. So, as I said before, magic was a normal, legitimate practice. Um, here is a picture from the movie. Uh, this is Moses where he's turning his staff into a snake. And then, of course, if you remember the story, his snake eats the snakes of Pharaoh's magicians. And this is normal. All of the uh, beings who are capable of doing magic have snake wands. So in ancient Egyptian religion, there were three types of magic. There was defensive magic, curative magic, and transforming, transformative magic. So you can hopefully do a prayer that the snake doesn't bite you. Or if the snake does bite you, you can do a prayer that the, you won't die from the snake bite. Or alternatively, hopefully you can transform the snake into something else and get it to fall in love with you. I don't know. But anyway, so these are the three types of magic in the ancient Egyptian religion. And magic itself was eventually deified and created into a god called Heka. And here is Heka. And as you can see, Heka is very beautiful and is also very powerful now. Heka magic is quite interesting. I'm going to come back to what the bar is later. Um, but essentially the bar, I'll tell you now, is your personality. It's a part of your soul in the next world because the soul has nine parts and the bar is one of the parts that is your unique character and your personality and Heka the god of magic used to activate that part 
So here we see Hecker. He is actually wearing the car symbol on his head. Okay. So um, Hecker is the word for magic. And it's also the word used to refer to magical practices. And we invoke Hecker to practice Hecker. And as you can see, he's there. He's wearing the car on his head, which is the Egyptian vital force. Um, because the spells themselves create the magic, we have a picture here of a snake. Um, when you write the snake, you're supposed to put knives into the snake here to prevent it from jumping off the page and coming to life. So this is how powerful Hika's magic was, um, that the spells could actually come alive. So now we have uh, Weretikau. We know that she's a demoness because she has Weret in her name. And this is the plural of Hekau. Um, so it's Heka, Heka, Heka three times. And she's female Heka. And we can see that she has a lot of magic because here her name is written. And this is Weret, Weret. And then Heka, Heka, Heka. So three cars. Lots and lots and lots of vital force. And her name means great one of magic or great enchantress. And she was the personification of supernatural powers, particularly female. Okay. And her name was placed on those ivory tusks of Tawirit when the women who were giving birth had to give birth inside the magical circle. This is what they wrote on the ivory tusks, her name. So um, the demonization of illness. Because ancient people didn't understand the biology of diseases, obviously they explained diseases away as the work of the evil wanderer demons. Um, so when you got sick, there were always two components to the cure. There was a practical component and there was a spiritual component. So for example, whooping cough was treated by grinding a mouse into milk and then singing a lullaby which I guess by today's standards would be a high protein diet and bed rest. I don't know. Anyway, we all know that these treatments were effective and probably they got better due to the placebo effect. And there is some thinking that if you demonize an illness and you then give people spells to get rid of the demons, actually they're participating in their own recovery. So it's very good for them psychologically to do that. They feel that they're involved and they're getting rid of the demons and they're getting rid of the, the illness and it's very good for them. Right. Um, in general, being sick in ancient Egyptian religion was very problematic for religious reasons because you needed your body to be mummified, intact, in good condition so that you can be resurrected in your next life. So sickness was a very big problem and it was also disrespectful to the gods. Right, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, medicine and cleanliness in ancient Egypt, and hopefully we'll go quite quickly. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the types of medicines that they did have and that they did work. So they were very good at what we would call first aid, insect bites, burns, intestinal diseases, parasites, um, iron skin problems and treatments of abscesses, tumors, bone settings, but obviously not surgery because they didn't have any anesthetics and they didn't have any antiseptics. But they did make in ointments. They did put leaves in their bandages to reduce inflammation. Um, they did know which herbs cured and helped which conditions. Um, and they practiced where possible quite good hygienic practices. They had toothbrushes, they brushed their teeth, they shaved their hair to avoid lice, um, and they even had indoor toilets, which I'll show you in a moment, but they weren't, they weren't flush toilets. Okay, but anyway, I just want to show you this. This is the toothache demon, and if you've ever had a toothache, you know that that's exactly what it feels like. Uh, there's some guy banging around inside of your tooth. This is actually not Egyptian. This is from France, um, this is from uh, 
just after medieval times, um, but they believed that there was a toothache demon, so there it is. And this is an ancient Egyptian toothbrush. And here you can see they've installed a set of false teeth. And what they've done is they've taken somebody else's tooth and they've strung it together with some gold wire and then they've strapped it in place with some knots. And, you know, actually they were pretty good at dentistry. I mean, this is 6,000 years old. It's not bad going. Right, next we have the headache demon. Oh my God. Now, the headache demon is called Sahakek. Um, he like almost deforms you through pain. And how you cure a headache is you strap a baby crocodile onto your head. And I actually think that this would probably the most be the most effective and wonderful cure because honestly, if you had a crocodile on your head, I think you'll forget about your headache very quickly. So there you go. Um, as for hygiene, um, they would shave their entire bodies every day and they wore wigs. Um, and these little things over here are cones of perfume so that when they walked around the cones would melt and it sort of worked as a form of deodorant they had perfume dripping down their bodies um, and obviously they wore wigs to get rid of lice and here is a scene from one of the temple walls where they're practicing circumcision because let's face it sand gets everywhere right okay we have an indoor toilet at least we have a toilet seat so they didn't have indoor plumbing, um, but what they did have is they had these seats on a kind of sandbox, like a kitty litter sandbox, where people could do their business into a box of sand and then they would throw the sand out. So I don't know, this is, I guess, the uh, part of Bastet, part of the cleanliness. And one of the intact medical uh, papyruses that survive is called the Ebers Medical Papyrus. You can now buy it as a book on Amazon. It's been translated um, and it's written in hieratic. And basically it's 700 magical spells and formulas and folk re remedies to get rid of afflictions. Uh, also how to get rid of toothache, lice, pests, scorpions, um, and also incantations against disease-causing demons. Oh, and they do have a section on, on depression um, under something called Disorders of the Heart, which I thought was rather cute. But anyway, you can buy it on Amazon. All right, now, what they did have was a pregnancy test, which, as it turns out, was urine test, like we have today. Um, they knew that if you urinated into a bag of wheat and a bag of barley, the first that one that sprouts will determine the gender of the baby, barley for boys, wheat for girls. And if neither bag sprouts, you're not pregnant. So there you have it. Um, they had antibiotics without actually knowing that they had antibiotics. They used to ferment a particularly thick porridge. And, you know, once it had sort of gone a bit off they would eat it and apparently it was loaded with tetracycline so uh, they were the first people to use antibiotics without knowing it um, also they used to pasteurize their water without knowing it uh, this is a guy drinking beer um, and he's drinking it through a straw because obviously they dead bugs and mosquito eggs and bits of grass floating on the top but the point is they used to drink enormous amounts of a very, very low alcohol beer. Um, and the fermentation process actually killed all the bacteria in the water. So this is why they never died of like diseases like typhoid because uh, they drank this low alcohol beer. And finally, one more thing about medicine is they found a mummy that had a prosthetic wooden toe. Um, they've tested it, it actually works. You can wear this with a sandal um, and it helps you walk. So this person lost their toe somehow. They've put in a prosthetic wooden toe with 
a bit of leather that fits over the foot and this enabled the person to walk. So I think that's pretty good going. So they even had prosthetics. Okay, so now we have uh, the afterlife and the role of demons in the afterlife. So the first thing I want to show you here is all the guardian demons sitting here. And as you can see, if you look carefully, they're holding knives. So um, this is the mummified body here. And of course, he's dressed as Osiris because he's supposed to kind of reunite with Ra and re-energize himself and rise again. So what happens when you die is you've got to go through all these gates. And there are guardian demons at all of these gates to make sure that you're the right person to get into the afterlife. So again, they have that dual role of defending the afterlife and throwing you out if you're the wrong person. So essentially, the afterlife was considered to be very similar to the life that we have when we're alive on earth, except that there are nine different parts of the soul, there are nine different stages that the soul goes through. And what actually happens is that in the afterlife, when you die, you sort of, your model of life then becomes the journey through the underworld and the re-energization with the sun in the morning. So Osiris dies, he goes to the underworld, he meets Ra, they re-energize each other and they get born again and they shine in the sky again. And that is the daily circle of life. So every person became their own personal Osiris in terms of their own mummy. And they had their own underworld, their own personal duat, which was their tomb. And they enacted this role of being born again every day and passing through all these gates which were guarded by the demons every night. So um, they had a special book of spells which explained to them how to approach all of these demons. This is the book that we call the Book of the Dead. They actually call it the Book of Going Forth by Day. And it was very important that you actually manage to do this properly because otherwise you could die in the afterlife and this death would be permanent. So you had to be very careful of that. Okay, so I've got a little bit here, but we're out of time. But this is just, if anyone wants me to email this to them, I can. But this is just the nine different parts of the soul, the physical body, the spiritual body, the life force, the personality, the heart, the shadow, the power of the soul, the name of the soul, and the intellect of the soul. Um, so these are the nine stages that you go through after death, which I cannot go into detail now because we're out of time. But just know that there's a demon that guards all the different stages. This one is quite interesting because this is car, which is the life force. And car is the kind of vitality of the person. And when people found these two statues, they used to translate the word car is double but it's not it's the spiritual double and you can see the car is slightly smaller because he's got to fit into the person um, and then this is the bar and the bar is the personality and each person has a bar bird once they die their personalities incorporate into this bird which floats above them and i know it's beginning to sound a bit like kabbalah because we have car and we have bar but you know i think it actually is connected and then we have the heart over here. And this is Amit. I spoke about her before. Your heart is weighed against the feather of truth. And if you found to be lacking, she will eat your heart. And they have these scarab pendants, which they put on your heart, because apparently your heart can tell tales and can testify against you in the afterlife. So you've got to be careful of that. Um, and this is just a little joke. Last Christmas, I gave you my heart. And the very next day, you gave it away. <laughs> um, part of your afterlife was your shadow. So um, as you can see, even the shadow is considered to be a form of life. It contains 
some form of part of the person you can see often drawings of them coming out of their tomb, literally a shadow of their former self. This is the bar bird. This is the bar bird. This is very cute. This is the shadow of the sun, if you can believe it. Another part of the soul is Sechem, which just means power. And I can't go into that now. We don't have time. And then another part of the soul is Ren. And part of destroying you was destroying your name and part of maintaining your life in the current life and in the afterlife was keeping your name. And here is the tomb. I'm sorry, the sarcophagus of Akhenaten with his name cut out in an attempt to destroy him. And finally, if you've passed through all the different stages of life and the different stages of death, you become Ankh. This is the united bar and ka to form Ankh, the intellect, which is transfigured into light and you become a star in the sky. There you are. So that is my final page. And my conclusion is just that I hope I have convinced you, or at least I've demonstrated to you that demons were not always evil, um, that they were neutral. And in fact, although they could cross between two worlds, they couldn't somehow cross between two languages. And they were literally demonized in translation. And OK, that's it. I'm out of time. So I hope you enjoyed it. All right. Um, if you want a copy of this, send Uri your email and I'll send you. OK. Thank you, people. Thank you very much. Bye.